Today's presentation is Advanced Analytics Using Real-World Data Can Mitigate Risks in Alzheimer's Disease, Drug Development, Reimbursement, and Utilization. Today's speakers are Dr. Billy Amzal, Dr. Susanna Ankern, and Dr. Lu Yan Ki. Billy is currently a Senior Vice President at Sertara. He has supported and, or, and reviewed more than 100 regulatory and HTA submissions using advanced modeling. Joining Billy is Susanna, who's currently an Associate Director of Decision Analytics and Modeling at Sertara. She earned her PhD in Sociology and Public Health from the Jagiellonia University in Poland. And finally, Lujan Key is a Senior Analyst at Sertara, and she earned her doctorate in Applied Mathematics from the Northwestern Polytechnical University. Billy, Zuzana, and Lujan, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to Zuzana to begin the presentation. Thank you very much, Susan. So, um, for the very beginning, let me just share with you the outline of, of, of today's webinar so that you know what to expect. So we'll start with a short introduction to Alzheimer's disease. Then Billy will speak about the challenges in developing a drug in Alzheimer's disease uh, and how the real-world data modeling and simulation can uh, mitigate any risks that arise in this setting. Uh, Luyan will present uh, two case studies where um, we actually uh, used modeling to address certain, uh, certain uh, information gaps. And I will take over at the end to discuss some ethical considerations in a secondary prevention setting. So um, going to the uh, introduction to the Alzheimer's disease. So I know we have at least several um, Alzheimer's disease experts among the audience, but for, for the benefit of those who are uh, new to the field, just uh, let me briefly describe um, Alzheimer's disease, um, which is a burden to individuals, families, carers, and society. And due to population aging, it seems like it's going to become um, even a, a bigger burden in the future. So uh, people who suffer from Alzheimer's disease um, uh, typically have problems with, uh, with their memory. So they experience memory loss and behavioral disturbances. Um, and with time, they develop also troubles with spatial orientation as well as trouble communicating, so both writing and speaking. Uh, and as their disease progress, they are also becoming more and more dependent, so they're not able to take care of themselves and their daily activities anymore. And many of them end up being institutionalized um, until death. Um, so traditionally, uh, uh, AD has been, could only be su suspected based on these clinical symptoms that I just described. So starting from a memory uh, loss uh, at the stage which we call mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease, uh, which then progresses into the dementia. Um, however, uh, in, the, in the recent de decades, there has been such a tremendous progress in, in uh, biomarker discovery and uh, avail availability and quality of uh, imaging techniques that really shifted our understanding of Alzheimer's disease, where now we perceive this disease as a, as a continuum, um, where a patient, uh, which actually develops for decades, um, and patients uh, who, um, or people who do not have clinical symptoms can have or have Alzheimer's disease pathology um, for a long time. Uh, before they are before they are eventually diagnosed, so that starts from amyloid beta deposits in their brains that leads to neuronal, neuronal dysfunction and changes in the brain structure, and then only uh, later on um, they develop any clinical symptoms. Right. So I wanted to point your attention to to this phase of Alzheimer's um, disease, which um, which progresses without clinical symptoms, that is uh, often uh, either called Alzheimer's uh, pathological uh, stage or preclinical Alzheimer's disease, where we can um, also speak about uh, um, asymptomatic at risk patients, so those who have uh, Alzheimer's disease specific biomarkers, but 
don't have clinical symptoms and pre-symptomatic patients, namely those patients who uh, have genetic factors that put them at of, uh, particular risk for Alzheimer's disease. So sorry for a small break. I have trouble seeing the slides. Susanna, do you want me to advance your slides for you? Okay, now you it's it. okay. okay, I managed. Good. So so just going back to our topic. Um why are we speaking about this uh, at the beginning of this call? Um, the reason is that these developments in understanding of Alzheimer's disease translate to uh, major changes in, in drug development uh, for Alzheimer's disease. So, so currently, uh, uh, we observe that um, uh, drug development efforts really target early and early disease stages. And we just wanted to bring to you a very good example of, um, of Eli Lilly's drug, solanezumab, uh, or Eli Lilly's compound solanezumab that was first tested in the expedition one and two trials in mild and moderate Alzheimer's disease, so symptomatic clinical Alzheimer's disease. So um, these trials failed um, on their primary endpoint, but uh, also showed a, a positive trend for efficacy of selenozumab, but only in the um, population of uh, patients with mild Alzheimer's disease and only on the cognitive endpoint uh, that was measured in this trial. So what LED did is they um, started additional or, or follow-up trial called Expedition 3 that uh, looked only at the mild AD population. And unfortunately, this trial has also failed to meet the primary endpoint, but a positive trend was also observed. So another uh, trial in this um, uh, uh, for this compound recruited uh, patients that were um, even earlier uh, on the course of Alzheimer's disease. So patients uh, uh, that have prodromal uh, form of the disease, so mild cognitive impairment. And this trial was terminated due to futility. However, there is still a possibility that solanozumab will um, turn out to be uh, efficacious uh, in Alzheimer's disease, as currently there is one more ongoing study uh, called A4 study, uh, secondary prevention trial targeting patients that are asymptomatic at risk or very mildly symptomatic. So the question at this point is whether early intervention is the key to Alzheimer's disease. And we don't know it yet, but what we see is that the, the current prominent ongoing advanced uh, clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease target early AD stages. So this is, this is just an overview of um, four prominent um, trials, out of which um, three of them uh, are secondary prevention trials, which um, target patients that uh, do not have clinical symptoms, but are uh, at risk uh, of developing Alzheimer's disease due to their uh, biomarker profile or genetic, uh, uh, genetic makeup. So now I'd like to uh, pass to my colleague, Billy. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about more specifically the challenges that uh, are, are rose by this, um, um, this context of um, the uh, new disease paradigm and, and how those challenges can impact the development of new drugs and the um, the, the access uh, challenges that are relate, related to, this, uh, to these challenges, dealing with a slowly progressive multifaceted uh, uh, disease like Alzheimer. So, as, as we have seen now, the, the, the shifting in paradigm is to look at Alzheimer's disease as a very long-term uh, prog progressive disease, which typically would put at risk uh, a number of uh, research questions or a number of decision points pertaining drug development, but also uh, pertaining uh, to public health relevance and payers' decisions ultimately. 
For example, in um, the drug development at the drug development stage, you know, when you deal with such long-term progressive disease, the choice of um, meaningful endpoints that can be uh, achieved in a, within in the context of the clinical trials is challenging, as well as the translation of these clinical endpoints into payers relevant or public health relevant uh, long-term outcomes, those that matter really for uh, for payers, but also for real world populations. Um, ready to that, a number of uh, design, research design and trial design questions are, are, are made more difficult. For example, um, the way to, to size and design reasonably those uh, clinical trials targeting early stages of the disease, where you know you you are shifting the paradigm towards uh, more uh, prevention or preventive type of, of trials, which typically would you know uh, uh, would lead to very um, to um, very challenging um, or potentially very large uh, sizes of trials. So there is a a kind of disconnect between also between you know or, or at least a gap between uh, regulatory um, endpoints regulatory um, focus within drug development and again the public health relevance that needs to come out from uh, those um, uh, drug development ultimately so for part of those questions may be addressed or maybe supported by dedicated analytics, where typically you would be able to model or to describe analytically and over time uh, how uh, early endpoints may translate into long-term real-world outcomes. Basically, um, developing trial to real-world bridging models that could ideally predict those long-term outcomes, uh, again, clinical, but also economic and burden-related outcomes from early symptoms and early markers progression. The other part of, of the, those challenges may be addressed or at least supported by the use of, of such um, patient level bridging models and typically um, by um, using patient level simulations. For example, to optimize designs, to project uh, endpoints uh, to uh, uh, longer term scales, and also to uh, to, uh, to simulate you know um, those outcomes in specific populations. Of course, and importantly, um, it is very difficult in the real life context to dissociate the technical aspects of those model developments from um, good practices in research ethics, and that's why in this webinar, we are going to, uh, to um, uh, look at both angles of this question. Before illustrating further uh, these concepts, um, I would like to also mention a very important uh, project uh, called this Roadmap Project, which was a public-private partnership sponsored by uh, the European uh, industry and European uh, HTS and regulators where the um, objective was to, uh, to uh, deliver a comprehensive overview of real-world data sources to inform um, Alzheimer disease modeling at all stages of, of the disease. Um, so a very, very extensive and systematic uh, mapping exercise has been conducted to map um, the available real-world data sources with the different disease stages and potential outcomes that can be used for decision making all the way. And not only um, and beyond this mapping exercise, uh, uh, this is modeling, these models were also reviewed and, and uh, a pilot validation exercise has been conducted to illustrate, to illustrate uh, strengths and weaknesses of those existing models. You may find out more um, in the references that we will provide in the presentation. But yet, important learnings from uh, from those uh, large uh, scale projects uh, were very supportive 
again towards you know uh, conceiving disease uh, Alzheimer's disease as a as a, um, a cascade of different stages that could be uh, informed by dedicated analytics and by uh, real world data sources as well. Uh, here in this slide, I mentioned a few a few um, outstanding learnings from the um, the consultation that we have um, uh, towards a, an expert advisory group uh, sitting beside this this partnership. But this uh, this uh, advisory group was, made, was composed by both regulators and HTA HTAs in Europe. So uh, providing feedback such as um, highlighting the need for validated and of course widely accepted outcomes that would capture those you know the the progression at early stages of, of Alzheimer's disease. Of course, also highlighting in relation to that real world data, the use of real world data to uh, enable long term um, um, long term uh, information of of the the progression of the disease, but also uh, to provide in, uh, um, payers relevant uh, uh, information, not only on the disease, not only on the patients, but also on the healthcare systems and the caregivers. Um, another uh, learning that is not uh, reported here is that um, it was highlighted that existing procedures, such as uh, qualification of novel methods and scientific advice that EMA uh, is offering, uh, and possibly involving also HTA bodies, could uh, be used to uh, to validate those outcomes, uh, those outcome measures, and to validate also um, disease progression models to be used in Alzheimer's disease. Um, on the same line, the um, European Prevention uh, Alzheimer Disease Consortium also uh, mentioned, highlighted uh, the this change in paradigm and and that positive prevention trial not only validates the efficacy of, of drugs, but also look and, and, and search about the causality of the treated pathway. Now, speaking about dedicated tools and models uh, to capture all these stages and, and again to address or to support those, those challenges all the way from development to access, as many of you know, you cannot expect uh, a one-size-fits-all or one-scale-fits-all uh, model that could basically describe uh, wonderfully the disease, the disease progression from early to end. Instead, you would typically have uh, in the literature um, more or less validated models that could describe at different scales, different stages of the disease. Typically, you may have um, uh, like small term, uh, short term or small scale pathological models that may look uh, at um, very short term uh, progression, looking at markers progression over time. You may have longer term or slightly longer scale models that would describe longitudinal outcomes over time. And you may have more statistical long term models looking at time to events. Um, so if I illustrate that in another way, or in a more specific way, you would have pathological models that would be mechanism-based to track biomarkers and used typically to generate hypotheses on the causality of, and the chain of causality uh, over the disease course. You may have longitudinal models describing clinical outcomes over time and typically to track disease progression and function impairment over time. And finally, those longer term survival models that would be typically very uh, in, uh, useful and informative to payers, um, where you know you would uh, describe at least statistically the time to um, mild cognitive impairment uh, diagnosis or time to dementia or time to any um, CBR or very relevant events over the patient's life. Typically, to inform those uh, those different models, um, a wide range of data sources can be considered. Typically, for pathological models or more um, physiologically based models, clinical trials would provide uh, those sh short term uh, information or very deep information, such as laboratory uh, data or imaging 
of course, typically with a, with a shorter term uh, time window, uh, as opposed to real world data, who, are, who typically uh, uh, be, be used to inform longer term uh, or longer scale models. Uh, yet, of course, often with more heterogeneity, more noise, but also much larger data. And so typically the combination of both trial data and real world data would be of very high value and, and high complementarity to, uh, you know, to optimize the information, the use of the information, and to leverage as much as possible from available information if we want to, again, approach um, Alzheimer disease modeling in an integrated way. And this is where, where we are, we are uh, going to, and we aim at, uh, you know, um, integrating the different uh, levels, different scales of information that we can get uh, from modeling and data, and integrate different data sources to, uh, again, um, support the, 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 um, the critical decisions in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so those uh, the different types of models, of course, uh, involve, technically speaking, involve different uh, structures, model structures, ranging from um, mechanistic models or um, mathematical models that are really describing um, a mechanism up to um, more statistical based models that uh, look at uh, the stochastic structure and the sources of viability uh, over time. And so, again, ideally, you would like to leverage from the, the, the best of each of those models and, and integrate as much as possible uh, the information that is present in the models and in the da different data sources. Um, so typically, those pathological short-term models could inform assumptions uh, on longer-term models, so, such as longitudinal and time tree event models. And one approach to, to go one step further in this integration is to consider joint models, meaning a combination of longitudinal outcome models and time tree event models in a seamless fashion to, uh, again, um, optimize the, the use of this information and support uh, best the decision making. To illustrate further this, uh, I suggest we, we now switch to case studies. And I'm switching over to you, Luyan. Uh, hello, this is Luyan. So thank you that uh, Billy and uh, Suana talked uh, quite a bit about uh, the um, uh, Alzheimer disease and uh, treatment development, uh, also questions from uh, regulatory and the payers and uh, data sources for quantitative studies. And also we learned some uh, relevant uh, technical uh, tools to do such analysis. So let's go to the modeling part. So first, uh, we just heard the joint model. So we start with this joint model. And let's start to understand what is the joint model. So the joint model we talked here brings two types of data together. And uh, one type of data is the longitudinal data. And uh, the other one is the time to event data. So for the Alzheimer disease, this corresponds to the two types of outcome. And uh, the longitudinal data could be the outcome at the early disease stage, so which means it can be the cognitive decline at the early disease stage. And the time to event data uh, could be the uh, events in the future, such as uh, a diagnosis uh, due to AD or hospitalization due to AD. So we can expect uh, three typical results from such a joint model. So first, uh, this kind of model can help us to assess the association between the uh, longitudinal outcome at the early disease stage and uh, the risk of uh, developing a diagnosis at a later disease stage. And also we can have two types of patient level dynamic predictions. And if you look at uh, the figure here, um, if you have some in terms of Alzheimer disease, so if you have some uh, observation collected at the early disease stage, for example, the cognitive decline at the early disease stage, you can use this joint model to predict a further a future uh, cognitive decline in the future. Uh, 
and also a uh, risk to develop a certain of uh, diagnosis due to AD in the future. And uh, we mentioned that this kind of uh, predictions are dynamic, so which means when you collect uh, more observations, you will be able to update your predictions accordingly. accordingly. So now we move to the case study. And um, first, let me recap a bit about the rational, since uh, Billy introduced a lot. And um, we just uh, briefly talk about that here. So when I worked on this project uh, last year, actually, we discussed a lot with uh, colleagues. And uh, if we assume that the future um, uh, treatment will be on the early AD disease, AD disease, uh, AD stage. So, which means the the most uh, obvious um, question comes to us. It was that how we can identify such uh, subject to be included in the uh, in the studies of the drug development because at such an early AD disease uh, AD stage, and uh, the clinical symptoms are not obvious. So you need to be able to predict that they will uh, develop a diagnosis in the future. And also, if we assume that now we have a drug developed, how we can show that this drug uh, have an uh, effect in delaying the long-term uh, disease onset. So based on such considerations, we built a joint model to leverage the trajectories in the decline uh, in combination at the early disease stage to predict uh, uh, risk of developing a diagnosis due to AD at a later disease stage. And uh, this is the result. So this is the model we developed. Uh, we took 2,000 uh, subjects from the Rush cohort, and um, the subjects uh, were cognitively impaired so which means they are at an uh, early disease stage. And also, we didn't take very old patients because um, they would not uh, benefit much from the future treatment. And uh, the two endpoints we selected here uh, re are required by the joint model. So the first one is uh, Alzheimer's preclinical cognitive composite. Uh, which is very sensitive uh, to detect uh, the early, uh, cognitive decline in the early AD stage. And uh, then uh, the second endpoint is a time to event, uh, with the event uh, defined as, um, as a mild uh, cognitive impairment or dementia due to AD. Uh, the covariates here uh, were selected based on the data exploration and uh, uh, input from clinicians. So this is the model structure. You can see that in the joint model, we have two pieces of some models. So the longitudinal model for EPCC is a mixed effect model. So here we have a power structure and uh, the sum model for time to invent data is a uh, has the association between the time to, to invent and the predicted uh, longitudinal outcome. And uh, the reference here we used, uh, it was the time to baseline, uh, time sense baseline. Uh, this slide shows the main result we presented at uh, the East for Europe last year. Uh, so first we can see that this model uh, showed us a significant association uh, between the, between the con uh, decline in combination characterized uh, by APCC uh, and uh, the, also the risk of uh, developing a diagnosis in the future. So we found that each unit uh, decrease in the APCC at time t will uh, instantaneously increase the risk of uh, developing a diagnosis in the future by 12% uh, at, at the same time. And the two figures here show the internal validation of the model. So first, we can say that uh, in general, this model is able to reproduce the observations, but uh, also this model is not uh, perfect. So uh, for example, uh, the sharp drop in the APCC trajectories were not well captured by this APCC model. So there is still big room to improve the model structure. <clears throat> 
Uh, so the first uh, case study will close with such a discussion. So first of all, that it's good to say that the joint model concept that we proposed works well in the Alzheimer's disease, and uh, especially with the selected uh, outcomes and the uh, uh, population, uh, we indeed uh, observed uh, the association between the outcome uh, at uh, the early stage and uh, the outcome at the later stage of the disease. And also, as I just mentioned, that this model that we developed, it was not uh, perfect, uh, so there is still a lot of room to do the uh, model refinement. So we can think about uh, changing different uh, model structures. Uh, we can also think about uh, using different uh, uh, model types. So we need to mention here that the uh, machine learning models uh, will be very useful in the future, especially with uh, the real world data. Uh, because uh, the data size will be large, so the machine learning battle, the machine machine learning models will be very useful for such a large database. Another point we need to uh, talk about is the validation of the model. Um, this is because uh, when you build a model, you basically want to use it to do some predictions, but before that, you need to validate it on other databases to make sure that uh, the model is able to be generalized. So, but in the real world, actually, when you want to choose a good validation database, it's not always easy because there are differences between like uh, populations and uh, uh, diagnosis uh, definitions, and even the follow-up period of the uh, different uh, databases. And all of these problems will, limit the model performance on the validation databases. So actually, we did some uh, pilot uh, studies on this point. So I will describe this uh, also in the second uh, case study. And uh, other uh, discussions, including the ethics, ethics part of the uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, it will be explained by uh, Susanna later. So as I said just now, that when you um, develop a model, you need to validate it. And uh, the noise in the validation databases could impact the model performance. So this is the pillar study we did. So basically here, uh, we, used, uh, we wanted to show the model performance uh, when the validation databases don't have uh, as good data quality as uh, the training data set. So what we did uh, was that we used uh, the simulated uh, uh, data set. Uh, and uh, there are six uh, predictors in this data set. And we predicted uh, if a subject will uh, develop a diagnosis of AD in the future. And uh, this model was, so all the models were trained on the clean data set, but was tested on, uh, or was validated on the data set with different levels of noise. So it's obvious that we can see it's actually already with the preliminary results that um, some models uh, perform quite well at a clean data set, but, uh, uh, it's not a robust uh, when there's uh, noise uh, on the validation data set. So which means that uh, the uh, model performance is decreased uh, by the noise in the validation data set. So this should be taken care of when you do the model in the real world also. And uh, the result here show actually that it's the gradient boosting method uh, is uh, very sensitive against the noise, so which is also within expectation because uh, this type of model is, ex is known to be this way. So that is all, uh, yes. And also we need to mention that this uh, full result of this pillar study will be presented in the ESPO Europe uh, this year. And uh, everybody is welcome to come and to discuss this um, uh, modeling work on such a challenging disease. So 
this uh, the two case studies from me today, and uh, then I will pass to Susanna to continue on the third case study. Right, thank you very much, Lian. Uh, so uh, at the end of this um, presentation, we wanted to also touch upon ethical considerations that arise in the secondary prevention setting for Alzheimer's disease. So before um, before I go further, I just wanted to uh, specify or, or just highlight that we uh, really need to, when we speak about ethical requirements, we need to distinguish between two different situations and one pertains to, to where we are today. So how to handle ethical requirements in, uh, in the AD prevention trial. So that speaks more to research ethics. While there is a, a separate um, domain, uh, ethical domain that also discusses how to handle um, ethical uh, issues or, or requirements in future clinical practice once we actually have a, a drug that is um, uh, developed and approved in Alzheimer's disease. So uh, in the setting of AD prevention trials, so research setting, mm -hmm. um, the, the ethical challenges are primarily uh, related to the need to qualify potential part participants to the trials um, and to manage the disclosure of the risk status to, to uh, study participants. But also uh, uh, one challenging issue is to justify uh, that there is a benefit, uh, potential benefit from trial par participation uh, to these uh, to these patients that outweighs the risk. Um, in future clinical practice, the issues also uh, revolve around these problems, but um, they really grow in scale when we think that um, uh, preventive AD treatment would have to be administered as a as a um, Mm, let's say a public health uh, almost intervention. Uh, so what we need to think about in this setting is selection of individuals to be treated. So we can imagine that um, that people would be qualified to receive such a treatment um, at some point of time uh, while reaching certain age, uh, but still they would have to be treated while being asymptomatic, and uh, the treatment might. Uh, pose a risk of adverse events. Uh, another big topic is to to how to manage uh, again the disclosure of the risk status to to these patients um, and how to monitor and handle potential consequences of uh, misclassification. So whenever we use a predictive algorithm, there might be there is a risk of basically um, classificating uh, patients to the wrong group. Um, and also the final issue that I wanted to highlight is the evaluation of the long-term benefit, the risk of, of prolonged uh, pre-symptomatic AD treatment. So um, here I also wanted to highlight that uh, at least several of these challenges are related closely to the, to the use of predictive models or other advanced analytics. Um, Mm, that's why we are uh, bringing these, these two topics together. So on the ethics of uh, Alzheimer's disease prevention in future clinical, clinical practice, we have um, had a chance to, to look at this in, in, in quite some uh, detail. And um, some of our thinking around this uh, subject has been uh, reflected in the uh, two publications so far. So one of them was a poster at the, um, at the ESPOR conference uh, that um, uh, was presented in 2018 that really set the framework for our future work. And by now we have also uh, uh, conducted a study, uh, a systematic uh, literature review on the same subject. So publication of the results is pending. If any of you on this call is interested to, to find out about the results of the study. Uh, please let us know uh, after, after the webinar. We'll note your um, email addresses and I'll be happy to share with you the, the final results once they're published. But going back to, uh, to the research ethics and clinical trial setting, um, um, there is 
there's always there's also something um, that we wanted to highlight today. So um, the the message from this um, from this uh, meeting should be that even though this is a challenging setting, there are tested frameworks for preventive travel that we could learn from. So let me walk uh, you through this uh, complex graphic now. I am trying to grab a pointer. Yes, perfect. So uh, really the way, the starting point for, for, for thinking about the ethical requirements in AD preventive setting is whether or not we plan to disclose the, the risk status of uh, uh, the risk status to participants. And there is a possibility to avoid that. So um, uh, it is possible to uh, to come up with a design where uh, a, blind, a blinded enrollment takes place. That would mean we design the study in a way that um, part of the study is a clinical trial, and uh, but there is also a fraction of patients that are recruited to an observational cohort and blinding is preserved and the procedures in the in the study are uh, conducted in a way to to not uh, to, to preserve the blinding so um, in this setup we'll, we'll have a pool of patients to recruit from and then we would uh, evaluate uh, the risk of these patients in terms of developing AD in the future um, so let us so so these would be um, cognitively normal patients that would, ha would have their risk assessed based on a, on a predictive uh, algorithm or uh, genetic biomarkers um, or genetic markers. Um, so assuming that such a patient uh, has a high risk of developing uh, AD in the future, this person would be recruited to a clinical trial. Otherwise, the patient would be rejected from a clinical trial, but would still be eligible for participation in an observational cohort. So what I just described is, uh, it's of course, an oversimplification of a, of a design that actually um, uh, took place in the tomorrow study, phase three trial that unfortunately failed, but the lessons learned from, from this study um, in terms of how they designed it uh, are valid and we felt worth um, bringing up today. Um, however, it's not always possible to go down this route. Uh, so uh, now I'll speak more about uh, how how to conduct a trial um, and ensure ethical that ethical requirements are met when we uh, plan to disclose the the risk set of of participants by design. So by the very fact of um, enrolling them into the trial. So th the way to go in such case is to first assess whether um, potential study participants uh, have the capaci capacity, so psychological capacity, to endure early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and uh, if psychological tests um, advise otherwise, these patients, such patients, wouldn't be recruited to a clinical trial. Another step would be to um, make sure that the patient has a companion in the trial. So. A commitment in the trial is um, is taken not only from the patient but also someone who would support the patient um, uh, over over the uh, course of a clinical trial, which uh, actually in this setting often lasts five years, which is a considerable um, commitment. So if this support is not available, then this patient would have to be rejected. Otherwise, the patient could be recruited, but still even following recruitment, certain safeguards have to be taken. So for example, the way we disclose um, uh, the, uh, the risk status to participants has to be standardized and um, disclosure needs to be made, be made according to a certain protocols. But also psychological support needs to be provided for study participant. And uh, uh, another important point is that um, we still don't know exactly about the consequences of uh, early diagnosis. So um, this, in fact, can um, still be studied uh, very well in the clinical trial setting. And what I described right now uh, is a simplification of a, of a um, A4 study, which is a large uh, trial of solanezumab in, um, in preventive settings that I already mentioned before. <clears throat> 
Right. So that was um, the end of, uh, of what we prepared. So that was what we prepared for you today. At the end of this um, presentation, we really wanted to uh, thank um, everyone who has uh, worked with us um, to, uh, to develop these uh, cases that were uh, referenced today. And we wanted to thank um, the Roadmap Initiative that we were um, privileged to, to take part in. Um, and we also wanted to acknowledge the resources that we used to prepare this, um, these um, presentations. So next to scientific publication, we, uh, uh, we also use clinicaltrials.gov and outforum.org um, to, to bring this content to you today. So um, yes, we reached the point where we'll be very happy to take your questions. So uh, please let us know if you have any. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Billy and Susanna and Leon, for that excellent presentation. I'd like to encourage our audience to submit their questions in the, to the Q&A box to our presenters, and we'll, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So, looks like we've got our first question from the audience. Someone says, there seems to be a growing interest in modeling real-world data, but we know that this data is noisy compared to data from a randomized controlled trial. How do you deal with the messiness of real-world data? Yeah, BD speaking again, um, take a, a first shot on this one. So, um, yeah, so real-world data are by definition more heterogeneous. Uh, actually, it is often the case not not always, but often the case. But typically, they are also of of a different size, and uh, and so that's you know the, the size, the, the large, uh, you know large um, um, uh, large follow up as well as a large sample size may be able not to um, uh, to eliminate the heterogeneity, but at least be able to explain and and uh, characterize this heterogeneity. This is part of the real world uh, populations or the real world uh, effect that, that uh, there is heterogeneity. So the idea is not to filter, to filter it uh, away. The idea is to, to be able to, to measure it and to capture it in order to, uh, to drive again the decision making. So um, that's one thing. Another thing is that Again, real world data may will not replace uh, our cities. They are addressing different goals. They can answer, uh, inform different, uh, different parameters or different um, uh, questions. The, the 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 bottom line is really to be able to leverage from what you, we know from our cities. For example, the effect of of age on a drug effect. You know that's really. Uh, Typically, better informed by you know, a clean RCT, whereas uh, long-term uh, uh, progression in the real world, or clinical practices, or adherence to treatment, or uh, yeah, other uh, real-world-related um, uh, factors, are typically better informed by real-world data. So this is more a matter of you know um, understanding this heterogeneity, this noisiness, as, as you as you, you say. And being able to uh, to address it um, uh, okay, again, leveraging what we already know from our cities. One thing is that yes, there may be um, noise that is not pertaining to the the real world population or the real world effectiveness, but pertaining just to the, the collection of data. You know, you may have a systematic bias or a systematic selection that is just um, uh, you know uh, induced by the the way. The, the real world data source is constructed and may not reflect or represent what is in the real world populations. In that case, this is a, a database specific uh, bias or heterogeneity that needs to be addressed via external validation in a given setting. So the, 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 the validation step is even more important when conducting real world data analysis or real world modeling. 
so maybe just to, to add, add to this, uh, maybe I thought we could mention some examples of, of what you just said. So uh, what we have seen so, so far is that there are certain types of information that uh, are best informed by um, reward data. So for example, the, the treatment effect in patients who wouldn't be recruited to a clinical trial because of comorbidities or some other restrictions or uh, in real world day setting, we're able to follow the, the um, uh, treatment exposure that is actually um, typical to the, to the clinical practice rather than set up at the, at, the, um, at the level of a clinical trial. So we can better understand phenomena such as lack of appropriate uh, up titration of the drug or um, also drug and drug interactions that uh, that might uh, be excluded from the in in the RCT setting but might arise uh, in the reward setting or in a regular clinical practice or just uh, uh, situations where patients do not comply and do not get the treatment that they were prescribed. You mentioned that proof of efficacy, in some sense, proves the treatment pathway. How do we confirm that the treatment does not confer efficacy via off-target effects? I believe the newest cholesterol-lowering drugs may be an example of this type. Excuse me, could you repeat the question, please? So um, I think what the, the, the attendees getting at is, Bill, you're, in your section you were talking about when you're, when you're um, treating a, pa a patient when they're still prodromal in an early stage, if you, if you get efficacy, it also proves that the, the mechanism of the treatment pathway was also correct. But the, what, so what the, I think the, the person's getting at is how do you know that this efficacy happened via the treatment, this treatment pathway that your hypothesis is aimed at rather than off-target effects. And I think he's saying that statins are the, the newest, uh, there's, there's data that cholesterol-lowering drugs are causing efficacy in, in uh, preventing disease progression, but, that, but maybe not through lowering of cholesterol, but rather an off-target effect. Yeah, it's one thing to relate early outcomes to early, to long-term outcomes, it's another thing to correlate early effects, uh, so an, an early um, effect on uh, an effect on earlier uh, endpoints, and how those would translate, you know, in the long term. Indeed, so typically, um, when we because we, we developed a number of, of of examples of such long term modeling in the real world, and therefore we ended up with a, a kind of framework where. Importantly, in this framework, we have to kind of systematically address those two questions um, because indeed, uh, in some cases, for a number of reasons, uh, we may be able to demonstrate, you know, that due to the disease progression, indeed, some early, early symptoms may translate with a certain probability into long-term outcomes, but uh, get, developing a drug on that symptoms or that, uh, that um, markers may not translate in any anything, any, any uh, relevant difference in the long term. So that's, that level of interaction with effect is very important to address uh, when you are developing such models. Indeed. Okay. Bridging efficacy to effectiveness is a challenge, but there's a growing need for this in drug development and pricing. Can you discuss how feasible and acceptable this is. Yeah, that's a, a related question indeed. So, um, so again, so the, 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 you need to approach this this um, this efficacy to effectiveness uh, bridging uh, gap bridging in a, a sort of systematic way, and this is what we we have been doing. For example, um, when working within this this, this other European. Um, public-private partnership called the Get Real Program. Uh, we are at the phase two now, um, but this was, this was a long-running uh, research project of collaboration uh, 
with the idea to bring earlier on in the drug development um, real world value considerations. And what, of course, one key element for that is to be able to bridge efficacy to effectiveness earlier on. This is where we developed this kind of framework and we could uh, typically uh, uh, categorize what are the factors that are driving disease progression or efficacy or the effect of the drug. Uh, so we call them the drivers of effectiveness ultimately that may interact again with the, the progression itself of the disease and also with the, uh, the effect of a drug or the relative effect of drugs. And those factors are typically categorized in, in, in two uh, groups, those pertaining to the uh, population, so patient level factors that may be time dependent as well, and those pertaining to exposure. Uh, in the real world, obviously the treatment pathways, the adherence to treatments, the dosing patterns, uh, uh, may impact uh, the exposure and ultimately the, the effectiveness. So developing this framework was kind of enabling a systematic way to, you know, to at least to test feasibility of this bridging. It's not always possible. Uh, it depends also on the level of information that you have in, in, the, in the clinical trials and the, in the real world. Not always feasible, but we ha there is a framework out there that is used, that has been proven, to be used also to be accepted because your question also addresses not only the feasibility but the acceptability by decision makers. So this framework and, and this approach has been uh, used in a number of, of uh, HTS submissions. So to, um, to defend a reimbursement or price, uh, for example, in the cardiovascular area or in, in respiratory chronic diseases where, you know, you want to, um, to predict long-term outcomes with so long-term real-world outcomes with, you know, um, clinical trials and, and efficacy uh, arguments. So feasible, uh, there is a framework, a framework for that, at least for the feasibility assessment, and acceptable to some extent, of course, of the, the level of evidence that you can put on the table with, uh, with the, the data and uh, the, modding, uh, uh, the modding tools that you develop. Looks like we've got time for one last question. Has this cascade modeling approach been used in other progressive diseases, and what are the conditions that it can work, both technically and from the perspective of the health authorities? Yes, yeah, so this is related to the, the previous one. And so, yes, it has been pro, it has been used, as I was saying, uh, in other, uh, for example, cardiovascular diseases, and um, and uh, submitted to some, um, uh, for example, European HTA bodies, and accepted actually driving uh, indeed decisions. So there is no, not yet, uh, you know, a universal guidelines on, on for each country on how to use such approaches. Uh, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, you know, um, we we touched on you know the the perception and the. Um, the, the perception and the, the support from, uh, you know, our HTN regulator, re regulatory advisors um, within the roadmap project. And uh, so there is a, a, a supportive uh, push and, and uh, a trend towards, you know, uh, getting more consensus or perhaps more guidelines to, uh, you know, kind of systematize or, or uniformize a little bit more or at least harmonize the practices to, uh, again, for, to, to support uh, ultimately the, the access and the development of drugs uh, in such difficult, difficult contexts. And uh, I can add a bit on the technical part when you want to use this type of model. So since this kind of model is, so the joint model is um, uh, combined by the longitudinal model and time to invent model. So basically, if you try to use this kind of model in your study, you need the data that is sufficient for these two types of models. Like for example, you need to have enough measurements for the longitudinal models and you need to have enough proportion of the uh, inventor in the time to invent models. And uh, also for the joint model, you uh, should be careful that uh, the um, uh, two parts uh, should have uh,
the same uh, time reference and uh, you need to choose well according to the topics. 